Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me fine? Great. So, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to their authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, otherwise known as the Copyright and the Patent Clause. This is the foundation of intellectual property here in the United States. It's been largely copied in many countries that have modeled their environments after the United States. And today, we've got some issues with software patents. So what's required to get a patent? The first thing is that a patent be non-obvious. And what that means is basically that given a person who's skilled in the arts in which the patent is covering, that it wouldn't take a trivial amount of effort to implement or come up with the idea or the solution to the proposed problem that the patent addresses. So basically, if it's obvious to a person versed in the art, it's not non-obvious. Pretty straightforward. Also needs to be innovative. Innovative. This is an area where the law has had a lot of problems with software patents and what actually is innovation. And I'm gonna address that as we get later into some of the more actual issues behind software patents and what is the, what is the crisis. And then the most important thing is that a patent must make progress in science and useful arts. If you're not making progress in science and the useful arts, we should not be granting someone a monopoly for 20 years on an idea. So, what's the crisis? What's wrong with software patents? Why don't patents work for software just like they did for machines or like they do for biotechnology or drugs or are even inventions of creating things that are creating plastics out of natural processes? Well, one of the things is that they are threatening our economic growth and innovation. Today, software patent litigation, just the stuff that actually make it, makes it to courts is costing innovators and implementers over $11 billion a year to operating companies, companies actually building software and actually practicing the science and art of computer science. And it's estimate that of the cases that actually make it to court, it's only about one in 25 infringement claims ever make it to court because, because of the asymmetry in the situation between patent holders and non-patent holders, the non-patent holders usually fold. The other thing is that the patent system was created during a time when the cycle of technology advancement was much, much slower. So, how is it actually doing this? Patents. The patents today, if you, I'm, I am a software developer, that's what I do. If you go and read software patents, you'll see that the quality of them is very low. Abstract algorithms, which is all a patent, software patent is, they're easy to state in many different ways. They're easy to state in generally very broad ways. They can use jargon, and the lack of any tangible components makes it very easy to create lots of complex language around things that are actually quite trivial. Think our there we go. The other thing that we have that is an issue and is creating the crisis is the concept of mutual assured destruction. This comes from the major operating companies, your Oracles, your IBMs, your Microsofts. They all hold very large patent portfolios. In recent years, to defend themselves against other patent holders, they've gone out and patented many, many ideas. And this is causing barriers to entry for smaller companies, startup companies, people who are doing the innovation and new ideas 
in the software industry because the big companies already have the large patent portfolios. And so you come along and you want to do something and they hit you and say, no, you can't do that, it's already in our portfolio. But amongst themselves, they cross license. And so we're creating an oligarchy of very large companies that hold the gateways that the new companies must go through. The new thing that we have in our patent environment today are non-practicing entities, or what are colloquially referred to as patent trolls. These are organizations that their sole purpose of existence is strictly to develop ideas, write patents, and wait for someone else to implement it so they can sue them to collect a royalty fee. Many of them have no intention of ever actually developing the technologies that they patent, and also, if you actually read the patents of some of them, you look at their descriptions of the inventions, they wouldn't even work. You wouldn't even do it that way today. But they are a significant growing issue, and we've heard about some of them uh, in the news. And one of them, the most recent one, the, the Metro Boston Transit Authority was sued by a company that uh, has the patent on announcing when a train is going to arrive at the platform. The other issue is when we issue a patent today, it lasts for 20 years. 20 years. So let's think about what's happened in the last three years, four years. How long has Twitter been around? About four years. The first iPhone came out in June of 2007, three years old. The laptop that I'm doing my display on today was released a few months ago, and if you look at some of the technologies in it, solid state drives, the, some of the software that's in it, ideas that didn't even, really weren't out there, implemented just a few years ago. Yet today, if you file a patent, you have a 20-year run of a monopoly on the idea. Has it always been this way? The answer is no, it absolutely hasn't. Software patents are a relatively new innovation in the patent system. They really got rolling in the mid to late 90s and the non-practicing entities, due to the low barrier to entry and the fact that developing software patents is literally trivial, have amassed significant portfolios over the last 15 years. So what's changed? The patentable matter has changed. In 1952, with the Patent Act that was passed by Congress and the reform, and that's the last major reform that was done on patents in 1952, the courts have continuously since that time expanded the scope of patentable matter. It used to be that they had the machine or transformation test for patents. And the US Circuit Court has completely gutted that to the point where methods and abstract ideas, as long as they are tied to a computer, are being patented today. The other thing is that the patent lobby, due to the growth of litigation, which is now an $11 billion industry of which the lawyers are the ones taking the lion's share, now have the money to both to let to pursue the legislatures and pursue aggressive litigation to expand the scope of patents because it grows their business. So, the other thing that the lawyers have allowed the people to do and the courts have allowed is we've gone from patenting the how to patenting the what. And in large part, the claims, which are the legal claims of what a patent is, have become orthogonal to the actual description of an invention. You'll see that many patents are just rehashes of earlier inventions with more and more expansive claims as they are filed again year after year to extend the monopoly period of previous patents. So the big example, the one that probably many people are familiar with, and I use this one, is the Amazon one-click patent. And this is a really interesting one because Amazon didn't invent it. It was actually invented by a professor from MIT, and his name is Philip Greenspun. 
he was deposed in the Amazon v. Bar Noble, Barnes & Noble case, and he was asked, he developed, actually, he developed it at a company at Hearst Corporation in 1995, he was asked, why didn't you patent it yourself? If it's such a great invention, why didn't you patent it yourself? An exact, exact quote in his deposition was, it only took me an hour to build. If I went down to the patent office after every hour of programming, I wouldn't get very much done. <laughs> and from conception to implementation, one hour, and then the amount of time spent on the patent by Amazon, they now have a 20-year monopoly on this simple concept that they themselves didn't even invent. So, what's the impact? And why should we all be concerned about this? Litigation. $11 billion that we know about from direct litigation, let alone the fees that are being paid by companies that get a cease and desist letter over an infringement claim that never leads to litigation and is very hard to track. Some research has been done. We believe that is as high as a 25 to 1 ratio. 25 people settling out of court, paying some licensing fee for trivial ideas without even going to court, and $11 billion in litigation going just through the system, not counting the awards, which some of the awards have been in the billions of dollars. We're developing a software development quagmire. Trivial ideas, data structures, basic computing concepts that are so basic that they really don't merit being written down in academic papers or having previous documented existing art which would invalidate the software patents because they are so trivial no one has done it. Someone comes along, writes a patent on it, and now you face an infringement claim. There's a study even done that pretty much any reasonable system of any complexity probably violates on the low order, tens if not hundreds of existing software patents. So, market lockout. Talked about this before. Mutual assured destruction. We're creating an oligarchy of large corporations holding significant patent portfolios that are blocking entry to newer companies. So what are some solutions? Big question is, who are patents supposed to serve? Are they supposed to serve you and I? Or are they supposed to serve the patent holder? Well, if we look at the clause in the Constitution and analyze it, they're supposed to serve us by progressing science and useful arts. And it's a deal between us as the people and the patent holders that we will give you a monopoly for some time as long as in the long term we, the people, derive a benefit. So, patent reform. We could go to Congress and lobby them to fix the problem and bring it back in line with practice so that patent, the patent system actually begins to serve the people and not strictly the patent holders and the patent lobby. Better judicial review. Many of these things are litigated. The judges that are hearing the cases are not software developers. They come out of law school, and we need more developers getting involved in law and being involved in the process so that we get better judicial review. More realistic damages for non-practicing entities. Damages and patent infringement claims are supposed to replace lost profits due to the fact that someone else took your patent and implemented and blocked you from selling your product. Well, if you don't have a product, what profits have you lost? Shorter lifespan. Right now, 20 years. Given the development cycle and the innovation that is going on in software, it is happening so quickly. Things that were non-obvious five years ago are completely obvious today, but the patent office is not able to keep up with the state of the art in software development because all they're reviewing are patents. They're not actually seeing the innovative work going on in the field. If we shorten the time, maybe we make software patents five years, seven years. 
it would significantly reduce their impact on the innovative cycle that we the people are supposed to be benefiting from. Then, personally, my advocacy is eliminate software patents. Do we need them? They're supposed to advance innovation. They're supposed to advance the art and the science. Big question, the other thing that the patent lobby is, do they actually create employment opportunities? Do they promote economic growth? The studies have shown, even from the patent lobby themselves, that they can find no tangible benefits identifiable in the forms of economic growth, employment, or advances in art and science, actual innovation that the patent system has created. And this is from the people who advocate software patents, let alone the $11 billion spent on litigation by people who aren't patent holders. And I was asked earlier, for the big operating companies, do they derive income from their patent portfolios? By and large, no, they don't. If anything, most of it's at a loss. They're doing it strictly out of defense. Well, a significant portion of our law is based on defense. Do we really need this? Is it necessary? In the end, I would argue that no, they don't. Copyright in the innovative cycle, operating companies in the marketplace participating is what is going to advance the arts and sciences and give us the things that we want. Our iPhones, our iPads, our computers, our cell phones, our Android phones, that's what's going to give us the technology that we want as a people, and that the patents are unnecessary. So what about you? And does this affect you? And it does. The cost of your devices is more expensive. Innovative ideas are not brought to market. Startup companies are stopped in their tracks from producing things. And those are things that you don't benefit from today that we could bring to you. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate this. Thank you for the invite. And if you want to talk to me later about this, I would be more than happy to elaborate.